What makes the Columbia Basin and the Othello area so great for farming? First is our climate. Sunshine and long days during the growing season, and usually moisture when we need it. Second is the availability of water for our crops, and finally, the wonderful soil we are blessed with. But how did that soil get here? Much of it came from an event called the Missoula Floods. About 12,000 years ago, the valleys of western Montana lay beneath a lake nearly 2,000 feet deep. This lake was a result of a huge ice dam from the Clark Fork River and was bigger than Lakes Erie and Ontario combined. When the rising water weakened the dam, it burst and a catastrophic flood raced across Idaho, Washington, and Oregon. The floodwaters ran with a force equal to 60 Amazon rivers and pushed car-sized boulders as much as 500 miles. It also carved out coulees, gorges, and river channels. Most importantly, it deposited much of the rich, fertile soil in the Columbia Basin and the farmland around Othello. Good weather, good soil, and good moisture. But what influenced farmers to start their western migration and eventually bring settlement to our area? While there are several reasons for the push west, one of the more important ones was the invention of the steel blade plow. The steel blade plow was invented by John Deere around 1837, replacing the less efficient iron model. It rapidly became very popular, and by 1855, he was producing as much as 10,000 plows a year. Eventually, it became known as the plow that broke the plains. So, the population began to move west, lured by cheap or even free land, and then encouraged by the Homestead Act, they sought more opportunities and the possibility of a better life. Some of those pioneers settled in the Columbia Basin. The first of these in the Othello region were German and Russian immigrants, followed by settlers from other parts of the United States. The early farmers experienced success with dry land wheat using horse, mule, and manpower. In fact, the region was so successful that a hundred years ago, Ritzville consistently shipped out more wheat from local farmers than any other town in the world. This success, combined with the promotion of the area to the rest of the country, led to more migration to central Washington. But sometimes these promotions were a bit exaggerated as evidenced by the following ad. The springs and autumns abound in sunshine interspersed with occasional showers, making the climate invigorating. The nights, even in the warmest portion of the summer, are invariably cool and pleasant. The atmosphere of the year-round is very invigorating and inspiring, one with energy thrilling every pulsation, brightening the intellect, and infusing energy and ambition into every part of the body. Unfortunately, many settlers were disappointed, not just with the actual austere conditions, but with a lack of readily available water. Well drilling in the early 1900s was difficult, labor intensive, and not always successful. As a result, many homesteaders were forced to travel long distances using water wagons to obtain enough water for themselves and their livestock. This slowed immigration to and development of the area. Once reliable water was found, however, the railroad followed and immigration increased. The completion of the railroad made getting supplies delivered and crops to market significantly easier. It also smoothed the way for increased immigration to the area. As a result, life was better for a while and the area prospered and developed. But, as all Eastern Washington farmers know, there will be dry years. The early homesteaders experienced the first of these dry years around 1918. Dry conditions meant significantly diminished crop production so farmers employed methods to grow what they could with the available moisture. One of these methods was allowing some of their fields to go fallow in order to retain moisture. Unfortunately, this had an undesirable side effect. Tumbleweeds, a Russian thistle, flourished on ground where bunch grass or wheat had grown. This noxious weed slowly spread west as the drought persisted. Today we see this weed in most of our untended fields in the form of tumbleweeds blowing down the streets of Othello. Unfortunately, the drought persisted and intensified over the years, leading into the Great Depression. 
His crops failed, land values plummeted. At one point, a 160-acre farm sold for $500 or less, if they could sell, and banks took over many of them until they went broke. Interestingly enough, Adams County became the second largest landowner in the area through default of taxes, with the railroad being the largest as it was the only one with the cash to keep the taxes current. As the drought eased and the country began to pull out of the depression, farmers slowly began to prosper again, aided by several factors. One of these was greatly improved equipment. Tractors and motorized combines replaced horse and mule power, making farmers more efficient. To put it into perspective, a 22 horsepower machine replaced 22 horses or mules. This made it more cost-effective to farm bigger tracts of land since farmers didn't need to grow or import hay and grain for animals or spend time and effort harnessing and unharnessing, feeding and watering those same animals. While better equipment was important to develop in the area, the biggest factor was the construction of the Grand Coulee Dam, an irrigation project that accompanied it. This massive undertaking started out with an idea by a few visionaries around 1902. However, construction of the dam actually began in 1933 and was completed in 1942. Although the main purpose of the project was irrigation, the focus shifted with the outbreak of World War II in favor of electrical power generation. After the war, the irrigation project suffered a number of setbacks. However, it did develop and irrigation water began to arrive between 1948 and 1952. Today, the project includes more than 300 miles of main canals, 2,000 miles of laterals, and 3,500 miles of drains and wasteways. The project provides irrigation water to over 2,000 farms with apples, wheat, and corn as the largest volume crops. How did this increased water availability affect the Othello area? Well, besides transforming the desert into productive farmland, it brought a different kind of immigrant veterans. In 1952, the Bureau of Reclamation held several drawings in which thousands of veterans were entered. In Othello, the last of the drawings, 7,000 veterans were entered. Just 42 names were picked, but they had the opportunity to buy the public properties that used to be useless desert. One of the more interesting happenings was the Farm in a Day event. This event began at 12.01 a.m. and continued until 11.30 p.m. on May 29th, 1952. During that period, 300 people worked to clear and level the land, build a house and outbuildings, and plant crops. The day became a full-blown media event, covered by all major wire services, magazines, newspapers, and newsreels of the day. Sort of an early extreme home makeover. The completed farm was presented to Donald D. Dunn, the nation's most worthy World War II veteran, who had been selected in a Veterans of Foreign Wars drawing. Today, the impact of the irrigation project can be seen in the value of the many crops produced in the Columbia Basin. In fact, it's this source of readily available water that led to more crop diversification and away from just crops like dry land wheat. Presently, the area produces a wide variety of agricultural products. And, the annual cash value of farm production in the Columbia Basin is in the billions of dollars. Although more water and improved technology meant more efficient and productive farms, farmers still needed people to work the fields and orchards. That's where immigrants from Mexico and our southern neighbors came in. Over the years, these immigrants have been critical to the success of agriculture in the Othello area. Besides working the fields, our most recent immigrants played another major role, trekking. As more and more crops were produced in the area, the need for trekking to get the produce to market also increased. Immigrants who worked the land found they could also drive the trucks to market. Then, through hard work and sacrifice, these same immigrants saved and acquired trucks of their own, and a thriving trucking industry developed, which was owned and operated by these same immigrants. Today's farms don't operate without the aid of our local agricultural support companies, such as cold storage, farm implement, irrigation supply, and feed and fertilizer stores. Many local businesses, too numerous to mention here, have been there over the years when our farmers needed it. As the production of crops, especially potatoes and onions, increased, 
Food processing companies recognize the value of locating their operations close to the farms. Othello now has several major food processors, which are a major part of our local economy. These plants produce almost half the nation's french fries, including supplying McDonald's with their famous fries. We also have seed production and fruit and dry bean processing operations. Today's farm equipment is state-of-the-art, high-tech, and helps our farmers to get the most out of their land. Great soil, good water, hardworking farmers and immigrants, and high-tech equipment. These combine to produce some of the best crops in the world. Farm products currently grown in the irrigation district vary widely. In fact, one estimate claims over 60 different crops are grown here annually. Othello area farm products are exported all over the world to more than 120 countries. What follows is a small sample of those products and the countries we export them to. I've traveled every road in this here land. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. I've crossed the desert's bare, man. Breathe the mountain air, man. Travel, I've had my share, man. I've been everywhere. I've been to Waco, Hyco, Hondo, Navasota, Winsburg, Jacksboro, Hillsborough, Santa Rosa, Austin, Houston, Galveston, Texas, Canada, Frisco, Buffalo, Conroe, Carson, Canada, Goliad, Grosbeck, Glen Rose, Red Oak, Post Oak, Live Oak, Lone Oak, no joke. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. I've crossed the deserts bare, man. Breathe the mountain air, man. Wind blowing in my hair, man. I've been everywhere. I've been to Krugerville, Flugerville, Van Horn, Val Verde, Brackettville, Bartonville, Beeville, Bull Verde, Bear Creek, Cedar Creek, Mill Creek, Mineola, Mate, Pearl, Monahan, Cellophone, Tuscola, Redwater, Round Rock, Round Top, Round Lake, Sour Lake, South Lake, Spring Lake, for Pete's sake. I've been everywhere, man. I've been everywhere, man. I've crossed the deserts bare, man. Breathe the mountain air, man. Drove my tires bare, man. I've been everywhere. I've been to Greenville, Gatesville, Gainesville, Alameda, Kerrville, Kellyville, Bastrop, Benavita, Somerville, Smithville, Stephenville. So what does the future hold? Even more advanced equipment, better seeds, and more efficient water use, all supported by precision farming. This video shows actual functionality that is available today with insight as to how future technology may support it. Advances in technology and farming methods are necessary to feed the first ever growing population. Where does a fellow fit into this scenario? Well, we will continue to feed the world the hometown heart. <laughs>